Amen. First and foremost, as usual, I take this opportunity to acknowledge our senior pastor, Dr. Apostle, Senior Pastor Mark Ellen one more. Amen. A man, a man that took me under his wings and showed me the ropes. Without him, I would not be here by the grace of God bringing forth the word because God has directed him through his vision to put certain people in place. People that will surround him to carry out his vision, vision of God moving forward. Amen. I acknowledge fellow workers in this van yet, the fellow pastors who are constantly working so hard for the advancement of God's work through the Agape Christian Church and preaching the word. Amen. One of our own is not here today. Every little while, it makes sense to take a little break and hit that reset button. Be revived, be restored, be rejuvenated, and ready to go for the long haul. There's nothing wrong with that. And let's remember our own fine pastor, Pastor Chemeka Oma, in our prayers. Amen? As he goes on retreat with his family. Also, the elders, the deacons, the deaconesses, all the auxiliary leaders, and the saints, I bring you greetings. Most of you, if you pay attention, that over two and a half years of trying to bring the parking lot into fruition, everything is coming together to the glory of God. Amen? I mean, if you can see that, you must be blind. <laughs> what God is doing in our midst. So, for those of us, those of you who comes in during the week, I will place plead with you, try to park on the street. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, as they wrap up the events. They'll be finishing up, including the existing parking lot that will be resurfaced and then also realign, strapping it with brand new lines in addition to the new one, so that we don't have to call anybody to move their car, his or her own car. Also, um, a friendly reminder in preparation towards the grand finale of our anniversary, I will encourage the brothers to stay behind. I know I have spoken to you individually, send out a text, but we need to stay behind in terms of our role for the church anniversary. It makes sense. So I will go ahead and move on to the text. We are preaching for this two months from Colossians 2:21. Touch not, taste not, and handle not. If I may have the Colossians 2, starting from verse 20, to get the gist of what this particular subject is saying, all the way to 23. Colossians, it said, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world. Why as thou living in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Everyone say regulations. Do not touch. Do not test. Do not handle. Next. Which, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrine of men. These things indeed 
have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect of the body that are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Amen? This particular text is an appeal from Paul to spiritual leaders that if they have claimed to die with Christ, they should not be forced to abide by the elements of forces of the world. For in verse 20, he said, these forces are doctrine of men since we are joined with Christ. Amen. These are doctrine of men since we are joined with Christ. Let me have Colossians 2, 12 and 13, if I may, please. He said, buried with him in baptism, in which you also we are raised with him through faith in the knowledge of God. Who raised him from the dead. The next. And you being dead in your trespasses. And the uncircumcision of your flesh. He has made a life together with him. Having forgiveness. Or having forgiven you. All trespasses. Amen. We should not. We should abstain. From the decrees of men. Decrees of men are self made religion, giving the appearance of wisdom. Appearance is deceptive, sense, with scare tactics such as do not touch, do not taste, do not handle from man made doctrine other than man-made habits. Let's look at our text, how Jesus take on this. From the book of Matthew. If you have your text, Matthew 15. I will read aloud, and you can follow along with me silently. Verse 1 through 13. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. For God commanded saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who causes father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me, it's a gift from God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, he called them out in verse 7. Hypocrites, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear. And understand. Not what goes into the mouth, meaning what you eat defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that this defiles a man. 
Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard these sayings? Then he answered and said to them, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. It makes sense? Will be what? Uprooted. That leads to the next message, the doctrine of men. Jesus confronted the Pharisees with this meaningless doctrine of men, so-called religion in the Bible. That is competing with God's words. Jesus in his early teaching was about how you present yourself before the Holy Father through cleansing. For God is holy, pure, and righteous. Spiritual leaders took it further as a tradition by defining what is unclean and what is clean, what is holy and what is unholy, what is righteous and what is unrighteous. Amen? What is good and what is bad. Beyond the word of God. The Bible is rich enough that it is almost difficult to abide by every doctrine in the Bible. Why add more to it to make life a living hell for the saints. The Jews emphasized on this cleansing business in the Old Testament was to set the stage for the coming of the Holy One, which is Jesus who died on the cross. We are cleansed through the blood as our ultimate approach to God, to God. Amen. To those who believe in him. So the Jewish approach is more physical cleansing. But they ignore the spiritual cleansing. It makes sense? The physical cleansing came after the spiritual cleansing. In our spiritual cleansing, we are cleansed from the divine saving grace of Jesus who died on the Calvary to shed his blood for the remissions of our sins. So the physical cleansing is a rule set by religious leaders that has no bearing on your spiritual life. Rules after you keep them for a while and then it turns to a tradition. When you make rules after keeping them for a while, it becomes a tradition. The tradition will eventually be codified into law. As a matter of traditions, people do things without realizing why they are doing what they are doing. When you ask them, why are you doing that? They will scratch their head. And tell you, we've been, that's the way we've been doing things. It is a tradition. Tradition doesn't make it right. Amen. Jesus is not kicking against tradition. He's not kicking against that. What he's saying is a tradition that contradicts the word of God. In a sense, nullifying the word of God. That is ungodly. That is unbiblical. Amen. So we have all kinds of traditions that even today we celebrate. Holiday traditions. Thanksgiving. Fourth of July. Christmas. No one is kicking against that. But all that we do, the word of God supersedes everything. Amen? And when the word of God is in conflict with the tradition, the word of God comes first. When the tradition has been codified and is used to nullify the word of God by adding God's 
ordinance. This is where Jesus had problems in this passage from our sermon. Amen. When traditions revolves around the word of God, it takes a different meaning. It takes a different weight. It takes a different added authority. In a sense, the Bible is no longer valid. In some religion today, it became equally weighed with the word of God. My Bible did not say as a matter of protocol, if the Pope walks through that door, I should bow down to him and kiss his rings. No. And we have churches today that have codified their belief system that's not of God and make it part of their doctrine. And you don't want me to name them. Just about every major church out there have violated God's honor in making the Bible the supreme over any other thing. I had a co-worker one time, a Baptist who was a police chief with the Baltimore City Police. When he retired, after a while at home, he came back to work for the college and got hired as a, also as a police chief. As I was looking at in his office, his accomplishments as the Baltimore police chief, I saw a picture of him with the Pope. Then I called him out. I said, man, what do you have to do with the Pope? You're a Baptist. He said, oh, when Pope John Paul came to Baltimore, I was in charge of providing the security details. Then I teased him a little bit. So, so he went over there and bowed to him and kissed his ring. He said, no, man, I didn't do that. You know, every what that person was doing, I just went up there and shook his hand. And I didn't kiss that ring neither. <laughs> Run the tape. I said, oh, you're a true believer then. We don't have to abide to any tradition. Now that the Jesus is talking about the Jews, you ought to know the tradition that they have codified. Somebody might ask, how do you know? One time, I was on my way early morning to our senior pastor's house. I took the route of Northern Parkway. Something was happening that day. So I took the route of Northern Parkway, make a right at Park Heights. In Upper Park Heights, this is where you see loss of Jewish community. I deliberately parked my car and started observing on a Saturday morning as they were going to church or going to the synagogue. And it behooves me what I observed. I noticed that every one of them has a big hat on. Because it was codified as a human religion that you must cover your head. Every one of them, every of their men, their husband is in the front. Not their spouses or their children walking by their side. And I, I can truly say some of them were almost a mile apart. I say, uh-huh. Okay. And I get to realize that when they enter the synagogue... The men and the women were separated. The women can sit in the back or somewhere in the back only, away from the men. Everything codified which is against what the Bible is preaching to us. Even from the Old, uh, the Old Testament. We are our Bible derived, the Old Testament derived from the Torah. The religious uh, book also specify that. But for them to go against that doctrine and codify their practices, it nullifies the belief system. What God has put in place. 
when I see a couple of my colleagues wearing their hat, I'm not knocking them. I say, wait a minute. I thought you're fit. Your belief system says you should cover your head at all times. Why are you wearing that tiny little cap covering your bald head in the middle? <laughs> they will look at me and say, bro, here you come again. What they call it? They call it what? Uh, uh, Yamoki or Kippur. Is he supposed to wear a big hat enough to shade you from the sun? If you want to go by it. That's us having the dialogue. But they say, well, I'm not knocking your religion. I just wanted to make a point. <laughs> Amen. I have watched them over and over again. And they watch how things have been codified that in some cases, like in one of our biblical teachings, talking about legalism, that it has been so codified that it becomes more of a, 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 not just a moral guidance, but a legal thing. That people are scared to their skin. Even in our Christian faith, you have to see the kind of law they have in place, even for their women. And if you're a woman, you have to walk behind your husband do certain things, and they say, what happened when they go to bed at night? That would be the same face he has to see at night, the very last one, and the one he wake up to in the morning in the same bed. So why separating yourself when you're out in the public? Make me understand. Amen? The truth is in the Bible. We do not have to codify the rules, the tradition of men, and integrate it with the Bible. Let me have verse 4 of our text. Verse 4 of our text. As I read, it says here, verse 4 of Matthew 15. Thank you. He said, for God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother. And he who causes father or mother, let him be put to death. Then let's take a look at verse 5. What is telling them? But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, meaning you are telling folks that it's part of your obligation to take care of your parents when they aged. And you're telling folks to bring that money to the house of God because it first belongs to God. What are they supposed to do with their parents? You're asking folks when they take out life insurance on their parents for emergency and funerals. You're telling them to make the synagogue the beneficiary. Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift of God. Many yes, the rabbi is saying, whatever gift that you receive from me is a gift from God. Amen? Now, let's take a look at verse 7, where Jesus called them to order. Verse 7, he called them hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you saying that such thing will happen? And in verse 9, he emphasized in the Bible for us to focus on the doctrine of God. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. All they are doing is in vain. And anything that proceeds out of your mouth is coming from the abundance of your heart, what you're taking through. And then in verse 19, Jesus moved on to say what you cannot do. In verse 19, for out of your heart proceeds evil thoughts, murderers, Adulteries, fornication, theft, false witness, blasphemies. 
Because anything that comes out of here, comes through your mouth, is a replica of who you are. It doesn't matter how much you try to hide it. The evil that men do comes from the heart. Comes from the heart. So the moral guidelines outlined in the Bible supersedes man decrees. In first, in Second Timothy 3, verse 16, 17, if I may have that, he said, all scriptures is given by inspiration of God. You cannot modify it, make changes, codify it with your own tradition. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for corrections, for instructions in righteousness. Amen. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That is the Bible. When you follow the moral compass of the Bible, you cannot go wrong. For in 2 Peter 1.21, reads, 2 Peter 1.21, For prophecy never came by the evil of man, the holy men of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So when you hear the word being preached, unadulterated word being preached from the Bible, it's a movement from the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that the devil has always been among us and is very restless. The devil has always been among us and is very restless here on earth. Even from Job 1, 6 through 7. Let's take a look at Job 1, 6 and 7. Now, these days, now there was a day when the Son of God, sons of God rather, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came along. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come from? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on earth and from walking back and forth on it. So even in the Old Testament, if you search your Bible, when there was a rebellion in heaven, and Lucifer and his cohorts, one third of his cohorts, were driven from heaven. They, didn't, they were not driven to the outside planet, planet Mars or other planetary movement. Rather, they came here to join us here on earth. For in Revelation, if I may have Revelation 12 9, it says, So the great, the great dragon was cast out. The serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceived the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him to the world. But we thank God for being in control. Amen. We thank God for taking preeminent control of those who believe in him. That Satan will never have dominance in our lives, as long as we hold on to his or changing hand. Is the devil tired? No. Let me have Matthew eleven twelve. 12. Matthew eleven twelve. 12. He will never stop. This is where it says, and from the days of John, the devil, again, and from the days of John, the Baptist, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violence taken by force. Since the truth is in the Bible. Amen? The truth is in the Bible. Anywhere Satan steps his feet, 
He is there to corrupt the process with the sinful ways. But Colossians 2.20 said the day we got saved was when we identified with Christ and was crucified. This is the symbolism of a baptism in the world that we are dead while we are in the world. And then when we give our lives to Christ, get baptized, we get submerged into the water, dead with him, and then we get lifted up back from the water to the newness of Christ. That is the God's word. Paul, Paul is reminding us that we can't address the root of the problems that most churches, most organizations are having with, and expect to have a cure. We have to address the root of the problems, which is in the leadership, for us to get some kind of a cure. They are telling us from Matthew 15, 1 through 13, that's in some situation or in most situations, the root of problems in the ministry is within the leadership. Amen? If we claimed to be saved, we should not be doing things according to the doctrine of men, including preaching and teaching the word. Everything should and ought to come from the Bible. Don't tell me the Bible say it without pointing me where the Bible is saying it. Otherwise, it's a doctrine of man. You blame it on the Bible. Don't tell me it's in the Bible and then you give that spirit of gap and there is nowhere it is written in the Bible. For Bible is God breathed. Amen. If we have to pass on the right doctrine, it must be biblical. Let me have First Timothy, First, First Timothy, four one through. He said, "Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirit and doctrines of demons, speaking lies." In hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared, seared meaning dried up, being dried up with a hot iron. These are the people of God who departed from the faith because churches are beginning to introduce their own doctrine as if the Bible is not enough. And they want folks to abide by it. They want folks to abide by it. And I've seen with two of my eyeballs, in one of those viral forwarding, was up, was up viral forwarding, where the priest is actually flogging, caning, which we call abuse, members of the church, for not following certain things that they have put in place, which is the doctrine of man. Second Timothy, let me have Second Timothy 4 3. It talks about again what to watch out for. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their desires. Because they have each ears, they will heap up for themselves, teachers. He's talking about the saints who are gullible. Eager to hear from God, but they're hearing from the wrong prophet or the false prophet coming to them with the word of God. Matthew 59 says, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine of men. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine of men. Or the commandments of man. Amen. All that we do, if it's outside our biblical concept, then it's nothing but man made doctrine. John 8 44. 
aligned us with the devil if we deviate from the doctrine of God. You are, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. So when we inject something that is not biblical into our doctrine, into our teaching process, the Bible calls us out on it. Amen? Second Peter 1, 21 says, For the prophecy never came by you by the will of man, but the holy men of God who speaks as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. We have to adhere to the biblical principles. No other options. No other options. Even we see it every day. It's kind of hard to discern somebody who is preaching the right gospel from the wrong doctrine. Let's take a look at Second Peter 2 1, if I may. Second Peter 2, verse 1. It says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive he says. The word here says is talking about some religious belief that is contrary to the book of the Bible. Adherence to some religious principle that is contrary to the Bible. Even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves sweet destruction. Amen. But the Bible Encourage us to be cautious when we are dealing with the so-called the people of God. Hebrews 39, let's take a look at that. It says, do not be carried about with the various and strange doctrines, for it is good that a heart be established by grace, not with fools which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have to be cautious. We have to be cautious. Okay? But what, what exactly, how do we become cautious of all these things? What do God want us to do? What do we have to avoid? How do we avoid the doctrine of men? For Matthew 7, 7, 5, if I may have it, it says, Beware of false prophet who came to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. We have to be on the lookout. We have to be on the lookout. You don't suck in everything that's being said to you. Human spirit is highly gullible. Romans 16, 17, and 18 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. The doctrine preaches the unity in Christ, in the body of Christ. Yes, there may be people who go against that unity. These are dividers in chief in the church, making sure that the saints doesn't get along that well to get to each other or get to know each other in a biblical um, spirit. But what do they do? They abhor one another because of what is going on in the ministry. It's happening now. For those, verse 18 says, for those who are such do not serve our Lord, Jesus Christ, but their own belly are by smooth words and flattering speech, deceiving 
The hassle of the simple. Be on the lookout. Be on the lookout. The Bible advocates unity of faith and not to divide and conquer in the body of Christ by the dividers in chief. Ephesians 4.14 says we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every winds of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Note the word. You know when the word is coming at you. And then you know how to rebuttal it. With the word. People are ignorant of the biblical word. Because they don't take the time to study the word. And understand what the Bible is saying. Yes, the Bible is deep. And I plot the great ministry of the children's ministry. Walking from January through Revelation. In a timely fashion. That has created a long-lasting impact in the minds of those children. And they will grow with it. Our kids are doing it. Why can't we take the charge and study the Bible from Genesis through Revelation? Galatians, Galatians 2.8 says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Be careful, be cautious of what people are preaching to you. For the book of Acts 17.11 said that we are more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. In that they received the word with all readiness. As such, the scripture daily to find out whether these things we are so. Study. When somebody says something to you, you take notes, go back in the quiet moment of your study time and research all that, those things to see the validity of what they're trying to say. Just don't take it and be gullible and take it in. Yes, I have a basic principle. I trust everybody. But trust but verify. Amen? I have to go back and look it up. Go back and look it up. Amen? Sean profane and babbling. Sean profane and babbling. According to the book of 2 Timothy 2, 6 and 6 through 18. There are people who have the spirit of gaps. They talk, 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 talk. You look at everything that he's saying, and I see all those things in very forwarding. That is not biblical. They have the whole congregation filled with people. All the things that they're saying is nothing but emptiness. Emptiness. That's all. Be careful. Be vigilant. First Peter 5, it says we should be vigilant because the devil, our adversary, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom to devour. Be more sensible and have your senses in order to discern the truth from not so truth. Amen? We already have a covenant with God. We don't have to dress certain ways. We don't have to do certain things to make heaven. For in Matthew 26, 28, say, for this is my blood of covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has already shed his blood as a covenant for us for the remission of our sins. And by aligning ourselves to him, having him in us, there is a reward. Titus, Titus 3, 5 says, he saved us, not because of work done by righteousness, but 
according to his own mercy by washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That alone in itself is a blessing, a reward in us. For First Peter one twenty one says, "For no prophecy was ever produced by the by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Amen. In conclusion." I will read Colossians 3, 1 through 4. In conclusion, I will read Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. 3. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is in our lives, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen? That is the word of God through me to you. The doctrine of man. The doctrine of men should not supersede the word of God. It doesn't matter what you do out there. As long as you do not codify your belief system and inject it into the Bible that's unbiblical, then you nullify the Bible. The Bible has no meaning anymore. Let's, let's rise, let's rise, let's rise. Most high God, we thank you for your word. For your word is the lamp under our feet and the light unto our part. Your word has moved forward to your people. Give us the discerning spirit to separate a good doctrine from not so good doctrine that has been nullified, codified. The Bible. It is not of you. Take preeminence control and our King of glory, O Lord, that the hearers of this word will be mightily blessed and give them the discerning spirit as we move forward, drawing closer to you, getting to know you more. This is my prayer unto you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen.